Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, today, we're gonna focus uh, again on the application of peptides and peptidomimetics and their use in drug discovery process. Today, we'll be focusing on part uh, 3C and specifically looking at solid phase library screening and combinatorial screening. So with respect to our outline, uh, we're currently uh, halfway through uh, we just finished peptidomimetics. Uh, you just learned recently how to make all these different types of peptide-like molecules. And today, really, the focus is going to be on uh, screening large combinations of these types of compounds. Okay, so um, we're going to be focusing on solid phase library screening, combinatorial screening. So before we talk about that, I want to bring you back to you know an era from you know around the 1980s and 1990s and talk about classic medicinal chemistry so medicinal chemists um, typically would work on individual compounds and they would make you know maybe two to six compounds a month and these would cost depending on of course the chemicals and the reagents and the salary of the chemists it could get quite expensive to around 2500 to 10,000 dollars a compound. Um, compounds were then tested once or twice in a single assay and any leftover compounds was sent for storage and was largely just left in a sort of repository place typically in a freezer and it wouldn't typically be used ever ever again. But the big problem was that this was taking a really really long time to generate compounds. Now back then, um, we may have had a very, uh, we may have had a lead compound and we just need to do a very small modification to get an effect. Um, however, you know, this was not a very efficient process. So old molecular diversity. So this involved companies, researchers making compounds that were in some cases greater than 100 years old. You could get storage of these compounds, 20,000 to over 400,000 compounds, many similar compounds. They would just sit in a freezer, not really doing much. A lot of medicinal chemistry is also inspired by natural products. So a lot of natural products have very interesting and complex structures. Um, this was also a very useful and clean way to get compounds, but often through natural product extraction, or if you're testing them, you would often get a mixture of compounds and they were not particularly clean. And then it was sometimes very difficult to identify what molecular entity was the one that was eliciting that particular biological response. Um, so classical medicinal chemistry, that is making just a couple compounds a month or extracting natural products as not really clean mixtures and having all these compounds stuck in storage was very inefficient far too slow and also too expensive. So in today's requirements, um, so since the turn of the century, actually we've had to really increase the synthesis rate by 20 to a thousand fold. And this is really due to advances in proteomics in genomics. And as we understand it, unravel new structures um, and new computational methods to understand these um, enzyme pockets, for example, we really are at the mercy of synthesis where we need to generate a larger quantity of compounds in a shorter amount of time. And um, what we want to do is figure out a way to do something called combinatorial screening so we can easily generate lots of new interesting compounds, but at a much faster rate. So can we do this using combinatorial synthesis and can we use this using some of the fundamental uh, aspects of peptide chemistry. So combinatorial chemistry, what is combinatorial chemistry? So combinatorial chemistry is a technology through which large numbers of structurally distinct molecules can be synthesized in a time and resource effective manner. So that's really important. We don't wanna be spending months making just a handful of compounds. We wanna be able to synthesize dozens, hundreds, thousands of compounds in just a few days. Can we do that? And once we make these compounds in a time and resource effective manner, then let's efficiently use them for a variety of applications. Okay, 
So I'm going to talk to you about um, a method called the split and mix method. And this originated in peptide synthesis. So you've already become very familiar with peptide synthesis. Uh, you can make easily just change the R group and you can make very diverse peptides. And we have 20 different amino acids and really it gives us a lot of different options. And nature is certainly taking advantage of that and generating um, you know, a, a, very, a wide variety of different proteins and enzymes with vast uh, structures and function. So if you take a look at this particular example, um, this is an efficient chemistry because amide synthesis we, is well adopted. We've talked about that already. In this example here, if we have, for example, 10 different amino acids, so not even 20, just 10 different amino acids, or we can call those reagents, and we have uh, five different reactions, okay? So we have one dash I, one dash J, one dash K, one dash L, one dash M. So five different R groups. Um, that gives rise to 50 different reactions if you have 10 different amino acids. However, if you put these in different combinations, uh, you can actually get a huge amount of different products. So if the top, the number of different products is going to be equal to the number of reagents, or in this case, the number of different R groups, which is 10, to the power of different times that it is being employed in that reaction. So in this case, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 10 to the power of 5 is 100,000 different unique structures just by having a pentamer with 10 different amino acids available to you. So that's a pretty powerful way to generate uh, a vast library of unique structures. And this is something called the split and mix synthesis. And I'm gonna tell you how that works. Uh, before we talk about the split and mix method, actually, I wanna actually show you what the solid phase resins look like. So if you recall back from you know the earlier portion, we actually looked at, uh, we actually looked at we actually looked at um, uh, these beads and how they could actually be used. So let's take a look at some of these beads. And I brought something from my lab. So this is just a just a dish here, and this is actually a rink amide resin that can be purchased from chemical companies. Okay, so this is the rink amide resin that we talked about really looks like a grain of sand. It's, as I said, it's this polystyrene uh, mixture. And you know, if I put it out on the Petri dish here, and uh, let me just focus the camera, or maybe it will auto-focus. And let me remove this thing here. Let's go to focus. Focus, where are you? Yeah, there we go. Uh, so you can see here that it's it really looks like sand, you know, they're just really fine beads If you touch it, it feels like sand and then you do that heterogeneous catalysis on these beads And then basically what you do is or the old-fashioned way is you actually get something like this Which has a stopper you insert your beads in it so you can see I have actually some inside of here then you add your reagents you get a stopper and then you rinse and wash it a few times and then you can open this up and let the flow through come through and synthesis uh fancier synthesizers actually are automated and uh some of them are even microwavable and to facilitate that reaction so it can go fast so you can actually do these manually like i have here or you can get if you have deep pockets you can buy an actual synthesizer and let the machine and robot do the work for you so i just wanted to kind of just show you what that looks like because we are going back to these uh, beads that we talked about. All right, so what are these beads? So these beads are um, essentially these little structures that are shown here, and this is called the split and mix method. All right, so essentially what you do is you take your pool of beads, kind of like what I just showed, and then you derivatize them, and you do reaction A, for example, and then reaction B, and reaction C. So you you literally split them up and then you can see that region A is now attached to the B, region B is attached to the B, region C is attached to the B. You then mix them together, okay, so this is the split part at the beginning 
and then you mix them back together to make another pool and then you split them again and then you do the same derivatization reactions. Probably the easiest way to kind of highlight this is to start with like a beaker and have 27 beads in it, okay? Of course, in reality, you have a much larger number, but this is really just for illustration purposes. So you're gonna have 27 beads, imagine this at the beginning, and then you're gonna divide it up three ways. So now you're gonna have nine beads up here, nine beads in the middle, nine beads down here, and then these will react with A, B, and C respectively. So now you have nine, nine, and nine. And what you do is you pool these beads together so that your total amount is now gonna be 27. Okay, so just like we had at the, at the beginning. Now, you take these beads, which, right, you have nine with A, nine with B, nine with C, and then when you split them, actually, it's gonna be randomized, okay? So within this pool here, after you split it, you're gonna have nine beads, but three of them, based on statistics, will have A attached to them, three of them will have B, and three of them will have C, okay? This pool here will also have the same distribution in addition to this one, okay? So when you do the derivatization with reagent A, B, and C respectively, you can see now that you have different products. You then pool these back in together to generate 27 beads, split them up again, right? So you have nine, nine, and nine. And then when you do the reaction again, you're gonna generate nine different exclusive products. A big, big reaction mixture. So in this case, we've had three different reagents, three different reactions. And so the total number of products is three to the power of three, which is 27, which is a big mixture. So you can imagine if you actually take this and split it up, not just three ways, but maybe 10 ways and have like 10 different reagents, you can get a whole bunch of different products much sooner and much faster. So this is called the split and mix method. Fast way to generate lots of chemically diverse products. Um, an example of an actual peptoid building kit has actually been synthesized. Uh, this was done by Kadatic and co-workers at UT Southwestern, but essentially what they had done is they took this core molecular structure here, which contains a couple glycines here. So you can see there are no R chains there, or there is, it's the hydrogen. They have an argin in here. And then what they did was they made a peptoid-based molecule on that. And the peptoid-based molecule had different R groups at three different positions, R1, R2, and R3. And they had all these different diverse amines. They had 27 different amines. So they randomized positions one, two, and three in different combinations. So that's 21 to the power of three, and that equals to 9,261 different compounds. And what's also remarkable about this peptoid building kit is that you can use, uh, you know, you can use unnatural functional groups like nitro groups that are not present uh, within our peptides or proteins. Uh, you can have amino acids that very, look very similar, like this um, histidine. This looks like tryptophan, but you can see here that you have some unnatural structures too. So it gives you access to a, a wide variety of different structures. So that's an example of an actual peptoid building kit. And lastly, here is another example from the Molecular Foundry Lab in Berkeley, California in which, again, they're building peptoids and they're making something called an amphipathic helix in which they have on one side, they have, as you can see here, a lot of hydrophobic type of structures, right? Lots of carbons, or even fewer carbons, but there definitely are not polar amino acids. So at X here, they place it every, you know, one, then four, then seven. So every third position, they add that. And then they add polar amino acids at every green position here, okay? So they can add these uh, serine type of molecules. 
And then at these Y positions, they can add either a carboxylic acid or amine, which of course is very polar. So another example is where they can diversify this alpha helix. They want it to remain alpha helix, but they can diversify the type of hydrophobic uh, entity that they put at X, and they can also alter what they put at Y, can give rise to a wide variety of different types of helices in a relatively short amount of time. Okay, so that's it for now, and uh, see you next time.